business, technology, and public sector in order to create innovative products for, uh, for government and society. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say that right now we open a call for startups for the new incubation program at fall 2016. And uh, there is a two week uh, deadline for that. So if everybody wants to apply with their big or open data startup, they're quite welcome to do so or ask any questions today after the event or by email at our website, antinet1.vc. And so today we are continuing our set of lectures about uh, investors and startups. And uh, let's welcome Wendy Dent. Uh, Wendy has quite a bio here. She, she's, she's a young global leader at uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, she's been speaking in Harvard and Stanford and in Davos at World Economic Forum it's as well. Davos. And uh, as it turned out, she's also uh, an owner of, uh, an of a data startup. And I think that's quite a topic to discuss <laughs> today as well. Yes, I was so excited to hear that you were all open data, big data startups, because that's what first inspired me and got me very passionate about technology. So there you go. But anyway, continue. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, today, uh, uh, as far as I know, we have like three presentations, right? right? Uh, Whatever we, we get through. I, I've okay. actually planned a storytelling pitch session for you, and then if we have time, I've got some top 10 tips for startups and also some top 10 tips for women in tech. So glad to see we've got a few women here today. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. I apologize that we're starting a bit later. I had such a jam-packed schedule that I had 7 o'clock written down, but all good. It's OK. I, I, I'm sure it's worth the wait. So a word to you, and uh, yeah, have a great lecture. Thank you so much. Just before you go, which is the clicker for me to uh, begin? Or I'm going to. Yeah, this is the one. That's it. Okay. Up and Head. down. Up okay. and down. Perfect. Okay. So yes, it's just such a pleasure for me to be here in Kiev. It's it's a dream, and I, I really enjoy speaking because you know, being a woman in tech, I'm not used to being listened to very much. So <laughs> I uh, I like to do some slides about that and have a little fun. And I'm sure you have a lot of people telling you a lot of the same things. I'm a startup too, and people have all of the same advice. So. I've tried to think of some out of the box sort of different things that I've learned. So you're going to be learning from some of my mistakes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk you through some of my own war stories in a sense. So uh, I like to be very frank and very candid. And uh, I hope we can have a, a little fun tonight. And um, perhaps, you know, we're in the Tinder generation, not that I've ever used it. You can kind of like swipe left if you like what I'm saying, or swipe right if you want me to keep going. Uh, or if I got that one mixed up. I'm not sure. Anyway, I was um, very happy that you, you actually asked me tonight to speak on pitching because my background is as a filmmaker and so it's all about storytelling and often in uh, startups we forget that we have to be really good storytellers and that's all the difference. So uh, I, I decided to call my pitch deck, What's Your Story? To, so we can kind of have a bit of an emphasis on storytelling. So let's get started. It's going to work. Oh. Okay, so I thought I'd speak through, you know, a few things to get to the topic of pitching. First of all, you have to get the opportunity to pitch, right? You actually have to first win that chance to pitch uh, to investors or to the media. So I thought we'd speak through uh, the opportunity to pitch. We'd speak through about preparing for a pitch. Then we have presentation skills is a whole another factor. And then we have the story itself. And um, have any of you done a lot of pitching before to investors? Or you're probably all more seasoned than I am. You yeah. have? Great. OK. All right. So first, you have to win the opportunity. Pitch pickup lines. Well, this is my advice of what not to do. <laughs> but let's see. You know, we, I've actually done a lot of startup conferences. and. Um, it's been remarkable as a woman in tech, the things that people have said to me. Um, I actually have a startup that uses the smartwatch to read your emotional response to movies. So the more uh, you're actually moved by a film, the more it increases your heartbeat. So um, a VC came up to me and said, well, you really increased my heartbeat. I bet I've lost a lot of calories listening to you. 
<laughs> it was an unusual way to have to then move into pitching my startup. So this is another example of what not to say, you look a lot like my next boyfriend, but in Silicon Valley you get hit on a lot, so I thought I'd just put that up there and think, what else could we try? Well, if you're going to be speaking to women, it helps not to say, oh, are you in marketing? Uh, say to someone, are you a CEO? Are you a founder? Are you an investor? Could I speak with you? Uh, for a start, it helps to flatter them. Uh, the other thing that I've actually said before to uh, start up, uh, sorry, VCs, is, you know, could you give me a moment just to impress you? And they quite like that. They said, well, I'm very difficult to impress, but all right, you can try me. I'm happy to say they then later said, okay, well, that was impressive. Sometimes people seem to kind of want to diss me and flag me on, and I say, hey, can you just humor me? You know, I've been doing this for five years now. Can you just give me a chance? And they usually give you a chance. So I think we have to work on our pickup lines for picking up the opportunity to pitch, right? You're not in, great. <laughs> All right. Then we have the whole issue of the press. We also have to pitch to the press. So you have to be very timely for the press. You have to make sure that you're speaking to the right person who has the right beat. It's no good speaking to the LA Times if you're not in LA or California. It's no good speaking to the Wall Street Journal about your startup, as much as they'll be interested, if you don't yet have funding because their rules actually say they can't report on anyone unless they've already got a deal or they've started up. So you need to think carefully about that. Again, getting back to women in tech, I highly recommend you find the press and say, you're going to want to cover more women, so I thought I'd let you know that I'm here, right? Got women smiling here, good. I think I'm resonating with some of you. And these are all things <coughs> I've learned myself. I've never heard these in decks. The other thing I learned in Hollywood is how to work the room. So when we go to events, we tend to meet someone and they get a little bit interested in our idea and we stick with them and we give them more information and then we try to get a meeting and we talk to them all night. They might not ever follow up and you've just lost the opportunity to pitch to the other 200 people in the room. The first thing I learned in Hollywood is that the goal is you have to work the room and try to get a business card from everyone. So you give the elevator pitch, you've got to get you know, the contact details say, I'll follow up, I'm so happy to meet you, and then get out of there. Meet someone else, because that person that you're talking to might not be the right fit. They might just be humoring you. The other thing you need to do before you work the room is eat first. Don't go being the hungry startup and finding yourself attracted to the cocktails and the hors d'oeuvres, and you don't get to meeting anyone because you're really starving, and I know that feeling. So. Don't get distracted, know what your goal is at that event. So Hollywood style. Getting back to that, this is actually a negotiation tip that I learned at Harvard, but I think it applies to working the room. Fall in love with two, not one, right? You understand what that means with negotiating. But again, when we're pitching, we can have this big fish that we really want to impress and we put all of our time and effort into them. And you know what, as I said, they're not the right one. Don't get attached to one person or one big company because that other company that you're missing might be the one that's willing to write you a check. Make them ask you first for the deck, right? We're going to speak a little bit later about startup decks, but one person in the valley said to me, don't ever send them your pitch. Keep them curious. Make them ask you for it. And I got fobbed off by one guy at Intel, and he wrote and said, look, can you just send me the deck? And I wrote and said, I'm sorry, if you don't have time to meet me, I don't think you're the right investor for me. I'm really busy. <laughs> and he was so stunned. He wrote back, I'm so sorry. It's just we normally only ask for decks because we don't have a lot of time. And I said, well, that's fine. If you want to make the time, I'll run through my startup for you. <laughs> I made him have to ask me twice for the deck and then he was interested. That was a way to get their attention. So that's my little sassy picture there. We're going to talk about a deck, so I put the ace of the cards. That was my ace to pull. <coughs> Don't be a statistic as well. When you think about pitching, you're going to have your own style. Some people are really good at decks, right? They know how to get the whole, you know, shabazz with the photos. I'm really not very good at that. 
I'm more of a storyteller. So you have to try to angle to get the kind of meeting that's the best pitch opportunity for you. Because there's a lot of different kinds of pitches, aren't there? There's the pitch verbally, like now. There's the coffee meeting. There's the informal networking over those cocktails when you get to give the elevator pitch. Know what is your strength and try to get that kind of meeting. So for example, for women, we tend not to do so well in the shark tank style setting because there's a whole kind of process and half of it, as we'll get to, is about the brag. And you know, women never are taken well when we brag about ourselves. When I get to the particular financials, I usually crumble. We'll get to that later. So I've learned that perhaps pitching at a shark tank is actually going to do me a disservice. But I might get an opportunity to write to that investment company and say, hey, I think I've got just what you're looking for, and actually get a better chance to present myself, right? But some of you might be absolutely good at shark tanks. So that's why I'm saying here, take what is right for you. Openers and closers, on that point too, when you finally get an opportunity to pitch and you nail it, you want to give them a term sheet and make them commit really quickly. A term sheet can be 48 hours, this is the investment I'm looking for, are you in? Why do you do that? Because that investor is going to be pitched another 100 times in the next 48 hours. The same in Hollywood. I've learned the bad way that you think you're going to play a little coy and don't be too fast, but in the next 24 to 48 hours, they're finding something else possibly more interesting. So this gets to the point of close. Strike while the iron is hot. So why I put this up here is don't pitch until you're ready to move forward. I'm personally not right now in the point of time where I'd be ready to move forward with a VC as much as I would love their money. So I'm not pitching VCs right now. When I'm ready to move quickly, I will be pitching them. So think of that big check that they have in lotteries and think, are you ready to ask them for that check right now? If not, should you be pitching right now? Right? Okay. Let's get now to presentation <laughs> preparation. 20% strategy, 80% mindset, right? So let's talk a little bit about that preparation for pitching. Who recognizes who this is? The Olympics? Do you remember her name? <laughs> oh, we don't. So what, you didn't watch it? Okay, I was in America, so there was not much else but the gold medalist. Simone Biles, okay. So a little bit of homework <laughs> for you. One thing that went viral during the Olympics was this incredible gymnast, Simone Biles. A clip of her before she got on the bars. This is her finishing routine. Oh, I'm the queen of the, the gymnast stadium. Before she got on the <coughs> bars, there was a, a camera focused on her and they showed her getting ready and then she says, and she hadn't actually even voiced it, but you could read her lips that goes, I got this. And that went viral, this gymnast just saying to herself, I got this. And what a wonderful thing to think about before you pitch, right? I got this. The other thing some people do is power poses. Now this is a special one for me because Amy Cuddy, who you can see just there, is actually a fellow young global leader of the World Economic Forum, one of our colleagues. She spoke at our Harvard course on leadership. You can see her in the top corner uh, imitating Wonder Woman. She's a very small and frail woman uh, and she spoke about how she would had to learn to be bigger. So for a lot of people this is really very useful. They say before you have a pitch or you have a meeting, go into the room, go to the bathroom, do this. But I'm going to be really honest with you here, because I said I'm going to be candid. I feel kind of stupid when I do that. It doesn't really work for me. And for some Asian cultures and other people, you know, they, they hold more power by being reserved and, you know, keeping things in rather than doing this. But for some people it works for them. And uh, I liked this shot of the late show, though, where she, she's sitting there and they were talking about power posing and 
the, the the talk show host, you know, puts his legs spread up on the on the chair like that. But I think for me, it was an example of what would make me as a woman feel strange. So I bring it up because I'd like you to just think what works for you, right? And again, there's probably differences for men and women, perhaps. Power dressing. I'm interested here, girls. This is obviously, you know, Marissa Mayer. Um, she's also a fellow young global leader. I read an article by a woman talking about women in tech who said she'd learn to wear cardigans. <laughs> and apparently Marissa Mayer, as you can see here, wears cardigans. I'm not sure about this though. What do you think? You're kind of looking, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. That's why I put it up there. You're almost scowling. Yeah, I agree. I personally think that when we dress, man or women, we have to be snappy. We have to look sharp. And I think Marissa Mayer isn't exactly the woman of the hour. She's been widely criticized. I personally don't go for florals. I don't go for cardigans. And what I even am doing nowadays is actually just wearing the one dress. No one's even noticed, but in, if you want to check out my um, my Facebook or something, you'll see there's photos of me at the UN, there's photos of me uh, in Egypt, and I'm wearing this one white dress to actually make a point. Zuckerberg wore the same thing all the time. And, you know, for women it gets so complicated having to think, what am I going to wear to make that impression? So I'm more making a statement by picking the one outfit, and I'm sticking with that as long as I like it. Uh, so find what works for you. But again, Try to you know, feel powerful in it, whether it's wearing a suit, whether you're a woman or a man, find what is your image, right? Okay. To tech or not to tech? When we're presenting, we have to make some decisions about what we demo, yeah? And I always thought we have to demo our product. One of the most interesting things I learned in Silicon Valley from a top leader in tech, a young global leader, was that you should never demo your tech. Demo a video, because always the thing that will go wrong will go wrong, right? It might just be that at that particular moment in time, the internet fails. Why don't I pick this shot? This is my imagination of the, the cables underneath the sea that hold the internet. And a shark just happens to rip apart that cable. And all of a sudden, all of your crane's tech cables and internet connection dies. That's a bit of an extreme example. But say you have one little problem with your, with your product or your bug happens. It might not at all represent you know, the, the technical issues you're dealing with, but it's going to totally give the wrong impression that you're not ready, that your startup's not ready. And it might be you're totally ready, just one little thing changed. So the recommendation from people is don't demo your tech <laughs> later. On that scale though too, you do have to think about cleaning your laptop. <laughs> don't have all of the windows open when you present, right? I don't actually have uh, any computer right now because I prefer just to talk with you, but you don't want to be having to flip through going, oh, hang on, it was that tab on Safari. And I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen. So again, image is everything, even your laptop, right? And if you're going to be in Silicon Valley, I really recommend you demo on an Apple because <laughs> they really look down on pretty much any other PC that you might bring out. Also on that image uh, thing, you want to have an image that says more than words. So a picture speaks louder than words. There is, I think, a very good example. So even today, I'm trying to you know, speak from example. I'm actually using my PowerPoint slides as my cards or notes instead of reading from notes. And I'm giving you a little bit of a tease <coughs> with every slide a picture speaks, but I'm only giving enough to keep you interested, I hope. <laughs> I'm not giving you point form things to read through. Sometimes people write a lot of text. And what happens if you're distracting your audience? They're going to be reading through while you're trying to say something. You want them to listen to you, right? So please don't fill up your notes and put a lot on your decks. 
keep everything very simple and powerful. Now we're getting on to the presentation skills. Let's get going. What is your style? This gets back to what I mentioned before about some people being better at presenting, live, speaking. Other people, well in tech in the Bay Area you get a lot of people that are almost autistic, right? They're just not very good at talking. They're extremely brilliant, but they're better, you know, giving a pitch on paper. Uh, so think about what is your particular style and show it off, right? Speak in sound bites. The person that wrote that article about wearing cardigans also suggested this. I think skip the cardigans. But one thing that investors look for is that someone who's very snappy. They think if you speak in a very snappy way with points that you also have a sharper mind. If you talk around and chat a lot, they don't seem to respect it as much. But I, I like you to think about every point I'm saying and find your own style because some people, again, are better at being conversational. You might be better speaking to people as if you're chatting to your friend rather than giving your whole pitch deck and saying, and wait, there's more. So again, find your own style. But think about the sound bites. If you want them to remember just one thing from your speech, Make sure that is up there early and that you repeat it, but don't be too kind of formulaic about it. In public speaking, they speak to people and say, you have to say what you're going to speak about, then speak about it, and then say what you spoke about. Like, you have to repeat it three times. But I don't know. I think you're all pretty smart people, and that would be really boring if I did that, don't you think? <laughs> but you might want to pick out one or two of your sound bites and make sure that is what you get remembered by, right? Okay. Anyone guessing what I'm going to speak on here? <laughs> okay, leaning in, right? You've all heard of the lean in book, right? When we speak about financial issues, women tend to, at least I do, tend to get a little bit more um, passive and embarrassed. When we speak about ourselves and our experience, women tend to feel more embarrassed or it's just not received as well. So somehow we have to work through that and get ready to pitch yourself. So this is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You need to find your own way to lean in. That Leaning Tower is falling over, but people go there to Italy to take photos and marvel at it, right? So how did I do this? When I was pitching in Silicon Valley, I knew the slide when it comes to talking about my team was going to be a problem. Because my team was me, myself, and I. <laughs> and I'm really not very good at talking about myself. I find it really embarrassing. I'm Australian. It's considered the worst thing to do. So what did I do? I put four photos of myself. Hollywood and doing this and that. And when it came to that slide, I naturally cringed and said, this is where it's really hard for me because I'm a woman in tech and we're not used to talking about ourselves. So I, instead of putting one photo, I put four. <laughs> so I got through that slide. It made everyone laugh. It made the audience remember that the ads, odds were stacked against me. And I got through to talking about myself as being the team, fill, filling every, holding, wearing every hat. So that was my little technique that way to lean in, yeah? I, I have some other slides later where we'll speak a bit about the leaning in point. So it's pretty hard being up there speaking about yourself. And this is the other personal motto that I've come to think about. And I've posed this a question here, what kind of fry pan are you? If you get the questions from the audience, do you find it hard? Most people don't. But when you actually have a VC really start to criticize you or question you, it can be pretty hard. So my attitude is be Teflon. Nothing sticks, right? The more that you throw at me, the more I enjoy it and the more I learn from it. And I've had a lot thrown at me. So just to sidestep here back to being a woman in tech, I've been in meetings before where I've had VCs and investors, one advisor said to me that he'd like to have sex with me in a meeting. He actually said that. He said, I'd like to be your advisor, but 
you know, what's in it for me? Because I don't think anyone's going to give you any money because everyone's just going to want to sleep with you. And I want to sleep with you. <laughs> I had to laugh because I just thought he was joking. It was actually really, really funny. But then later that night, he was on Facebook and started writing to me saying, you're such a witch, you're cursing me, and I can't stop thinking of you all night long right now. And I realized he hadn't been joking. Yeah, I told you I'm going to be candid with you all tonight. I, why, why else have me here? So it was really hard for me. I, I'm a pretty tough girl. I've been in Hollywood. In Hollywood, I've had a, I've had a producer say to me, fuck me or leave. <laughs> yeah. So I thought I was ready for everything. Fuck me or leave was about, was about as much as I could cope with. But then when this guy said to me about, you know, sleeping with me, um, it really shook me, and I had to find a way after that to just learn to be Teflon and realize that being a startup founder is really, you know, quite, quite fun, you know? I mean, what other job do you get to go through all of this, right? So that's why I put the fry pan on there. Please remember it if it means something to you. Women, I hope you don't have to go through this in Ukraine. From my experiences here in the last few days, it seems to me that you, you're much better than you know, the US and California. But if you venture over there, be ready, be Teflon. It's brutal out there, okay? Good. Speaking on that issue too, you hold the remote control. I'm not meaning here about the clicker. <coughs> I'm meaning that when you pitch, whether it's that coffee meeting or speaking at an event uh, or at a shark tank, they're going to try to interrupt you. If you're on national TV like a shark tank, you probably can't tell them not to. But if you're in any other event, why not? Because they ruin your speech. They ruin your pitch. You know, you have it all worked out of your story to tell. And then they start saying, you know, but what's your seed funding? How much have you got? Or if you're a woman, they said, but do you have kids? And all of a sudden, you have to try to get back on track. Why let them ruin your moment? Why not say, I'll get back to you with that. Let me just run through the story of my startup. Take control, please. You have one opportunity. And they could even be doing it just to test you. Because some of them like playing these games. It's sick. <laughs> Right? So my advice, take it or leave it as you wish, but is to take back control of your pitch and tell your story. Don't let them interrupt. Okay? So now we're getting back to the story itself, uh, the content. Oh gosh, people are writing up. So exciting. I hope I'm helping you. <laughs> Let's think about the story you're going to tell. Who is going to hound you? for your service or product, right? You might think, uh, you know, you want to impress the media, you want to impress all of those VCs. But the one thing I've learned lately is the people that are going to keep my business alive are actually the users. Some of the VCs will not care whether I live or die or my startup dies. But I actually have right now 60,000 filmmakers on a database that I can say, would you like to have your film on my website? And I give you heartbeat, heartbeat response to the, your movies. And these are filmmakers that have already started hounding me. When can I get, when I can get my film on this site? Are you started up yet? What's going on? What better position to be in than have your users harass you? I want in. <laughs> I don't know why I've been wasting my time with all the VCs, really. So when I think about my startup, I have to realize who is the most important person. It's the users. And for example, my users are not even the film viewers. It's actually the filmmakers that are my customers that want to put their film on my platform and then my watch reads their heartbeat response. So keep that always as your core. And in your startup story, I think you need to tell that to the investors because they will remember that and they will know they're not the, they're not the top dog. <laughs> you can do it on your own, right? If you don't need their money, you're in a more powerful position. So that's why I bring this up, right? What's that in American? I've had a, a few people lately, even in uh, Kiev, start 
speaking to me and they automatically start pitching to me about what they're doing and they're, someone yesterday said, I'm in the ICJI, I can't even remember what it was because it meant nothing to me. I'm sure it was extremely great but I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And I wanted to put this in because often we can actually be pitching and we can mention things. And I did this in a pitch. I actually said, for my startup, I have um, a, a venture that has been offered to me to partner with Canal Plus. You guys know what Canal Plus is, do you? Okay, yes or no? All right, I don't want to take it for granted. It's one of the biggest European TV channels, right? So I was speaking about that in America, and the VC didn't give me much attention. And then later I had to translate and said, by the way, I'm sorry it didn't mention at the time, but that's why CBS, we're talking, you know, 100 million users. Oh, that woke them up. If only I'd mentioned and translated that the customer I was talking about was like CBS in America, it would have meant something. But I lost that opportunity. You only get one chance for a first impression. So please, you're, you're from Ukraine, there's companies here, I don't know who they are, but I'm sure they're exceptional. Tell in your speech who they are. It'd be like me meeting you guys and saying, well, I'm a WEF YGL. So what? What is that? Well, it's a young global leader. It's one of 200 that the World Economic Forum picked together with Chelsea Clinton and Will I Am in my year. Which should I have said? So translate into American or into British or you know, whichever country you're pitching to. I'm sorry for being a little bit American focused here. I've spent most of my time there lately, hence my confused accent. Getting back to this point two of lingo, how big is your data? I put this in especially for you guys because you're all in data, data, as you say in America. There is a, a speech that a colleague of mine, a young global leader, YGL, did that that's, was titled, I don't care how big your data is. <laughs> and uh, that's a very Australian kind of attitude. But we, we tend to kind of put in all these buzzwords and sort of hope that they're going to impress people. But think of the VCs, how many people are talking about their big data. I think we have to be really careful to not overuse those buzzwords. So my company is called Cinemerse for immersive cinema. <coughs> when I started up, that was a term that was unheard of, and hence I've got the domain, and people like the name. But I even cringe now, because everyone and their grandmother calls their company immersive. Um, it's, it's actually embarrassing to me to even use this term immersive anymore, because it's been so overused. So please, I think... I suggest humbly to think a little bit about maybe finding some new terms or new words or to give a little bit more than that term. So for example, with my startup I started talking instead of about IoT or IOT, I said I'm doing smart media. I'm doing responsive films, responsive media, films that respond to your emotions. And that made people in Silicon Valley go, ooh, because they've never heard of that before. I think I might be the first person who started that. And I told them I'm changing the term biodata to mean data that's biological that I can use to read your heartbeat. It's not actually used traditionally in that term. So, hope that might help. You might have some secrets too that you uh, don't want to give away in your pitch. So it's a little bit of a dilemma. When I'm pitching, there are certain times and places I don't want to tell the audience that I'm actually using smartwatches to read your emotions. So it's a bit of a quandary. I think it can really help to actually keep the secrets to yourself. And even, for example, when it comes to the financials, because that's my weak point, I say, well, I can't divulge my financials right now for various meetings and considering. So, you know, I follow up with you later. It keeps this air of mystery and it drives the VCs crazy because they're used to people telling them everything and more. Keep it a mystery. If you have trade secrets, yay for you. Don't give them away. So, think about what you might not want to pitch. The aha. The one thing that I've learned as a documentary filmmaker is, okay, never to be boring for a start, but one problem with documentaries is people usually 
watch a documentary thinking they know everything that it's going to go into. Like, okay, it's a film about orphanages. Oh, the poor children in the orphanage. Oh, and they get bored with documentaries because they think, I've already heard all of this before. So with my films, my motto is to always be surprising and find the aha, what is the audience going to see that they go, wow, I never knew that before. What is their aha moment? The same when you're pitching. If you don't have an aha moment for them to go, oh, I didn't realize that. Like, aha, there are actually women in uh, the Middle East or Africa that, that want to use these Google Glasses. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. We could open that market. You don't have anything if you don't have something to wow them. So it might be you know, a particular thing that you're doing that's unique. For me, I'll give you the example of my startup, Cinemas. The elevator pitch is immersive, wearable, and smart cinema on demand that can read your emotions. Interactive and map to go. I worked out from a lot of talking to people that the aha part was the part that can read your emotions. Right? Everyone had already heard immersive, da da da. When I said that, people listened. So work out your wow for the audience. The other thing that we tend to do is talk a little bit too much about ourselves. Maybe not the women, we're not so good at that. But it's not all about you, right? If you want, please tell your fantastic story about your, your journey, we'll get to that. But again, talking war stories. Sometimes when you have that opportunity to give your startup pitch, uh, people can ramble into this very long tale about what inspired them and you've lost the VC or the press before you get to your startup. I've heard that too many times. Um, just the other day in Kiev, I was being introduced to people and I said, oh, you know, so tell me about you, I knew nothing. And this wonderful girl started telling me about the place she works and then she went on for about 10 minutes and it made me feel really uncomfortable because I really wasn't interested. So I had to try to butt in and say, so you know, do you really enjoy living in Kiev or something. But the lesson of it is, please just start with the elevator speech and not the 10 minute deck. And try not to make it all about you, right? Unless there's really a particular reason for that. Needs and wants are something that I personally found very interesting to think about. Is this um, something that you've heard of before? Uh, I'm just curious, because I'm, I'm not quite sure if various pitch techniques travel. So. When we're pitching our startup, I'm sure you're all familiar with you know, problem and solutions, which we'll get to. But one interesting thing I learned was to try to find what is the need for your audience or users rather than the want. So for example, you recognize this logo, right? The thumbs up, the Facebook. If you were talking about Facebook, would that be a need for people or a want? That service, what do you think? Different people will be different. Yeah. For some, it's really neat you know, because it's they are you know, they are uh, the only channel of uh, communication with some relatives. Or That's a very good point. It's neat. But yeah. uh, for others, it's like uh, we wish to uh, wish to have. So. Right. For some people, it's more of a it's sort of fun thing or luxury, and others, if it's their only channel of they communication. Used to, they used to. They're used to it, yeah. It's not neat. It's yeah. Just, uh, good, good point, yeah. And another way to think about things is what is the fundamental need that you're, you're providing rather than a want? So, for example, um, my thinking is with Facebook, you could say that it's a fun thing, it's a want to be able to share your photos and to do this. Or you could pose it as people need to communicate. And we're in a world where we're more isolated and we're more um, you know, connected to our technology. So we need a digital way to share our identity. I mean, I'm talking aloud here. I haven't planned that. But do you see the difference in emphasis there? So I hear you're talking about um, data and about services for, for your startups. I'm sure there are some that are absolutely fundamental needs. So, you know, my suggestion here is when you're pitching, make sure to actually pivot that 
as something that is so vital that it is a need because sometimes when we're pitching we tend to say people really want this product and the VCs are trained to think about these things they do this day in day out and they will go hmm very good interesting but it's not a need so my startup for example you could say well it's about film that's clearly just an entertainment thing right but actually people need to be moved they need to be excited and have emotional experiences to enrich our lives. So I would position it as a need and we need to know how much it's moved you. Because you know, when I went to film school, I spent four years learning how to give someone an emotional reaction. I'm a master manipulator. I spent four years learning how to manipulate your emotions. That's a need. <laughs> So it's all how you present it, and again, this gets back to storytelling, right? How do we tell our story so that it matters? Okay, are we doing okay here? People are writing notes, I'm so excited about that. You see my film focus here. Show me the money. You all know that movie, right? Oh gosh, I live for the day when I can say this to an agent or a VC, and I've tried it. Show me the money. I, again getting back to our points later, I tend to feel, show me the money later. <laughs> I'm not good at that, so I've learned how to kind of keep it to the end of my slide deck and say, well, you know, I'm looking at this and that potential acquisition, da, 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 da. I defocus it. But some of you guys are so good at talking money and you know, I need you on my team. I think go for it. Bring, all, bring out those figures early. Uh, so, Again, this is, comes back to storytelling and personal style, right? All right, the pitch itself. I think some of you have already done this, so I'm pleased. Uh, but some of you have not thought about it in this way. You've heard about the decks. I find them very boring. But I do find them more interesting when I translate them into stories like Hollywood. So uh, I just picked this one, Blonde Ambition, Small Town Girl, Big Time Dreams, that's B. I learned lately that women actually have better chances of being CEOs and getting money if they're blonde. That's scary. Get the hair dye. I'm going to go lighter tomorrow, you wait. So anyway, this is a story, and I could pitch this story. I was actually born in Melanesia, in a little South Pacific town with coconut trees. It's true. I spoke Pigeon English. I lived with the Fuzzy Wuzzy tribe. And that's not a joke. I really did. <laughs> yes, I know. It's a long way from Papua New Guinea to the Ukraine and Silicon Valley. So I'm telling you a story. It's actually a true story. I know. I was actually born stateless without nationality, like a refugee, but I was much better off. But this is a story. The same thing with your startups. Tell a story. Let's get to that. So one thing you learn in Hollywood is when you tell a story, you don't go from A to Z. Who knows what that is? Can you rec see, you've got a little bit warped in my photo editing. It's a K. Why have I put a K there, do you think? Wendy's masterclass is going, okay, we have one hand up. Because you shouldn't tell a story from A to Z, you start at K. You start in the middle with a, a little way in with an interesting hook and then you backtrack. So in a movie, they'll have this exciting car, car chase scene and you don't know who and what it's about, but they get a hook and then they go back to the beginning and introduce you to Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie. So for example, I saw a Facebook pitch deck and the front of the pe Facebook pitch deck said, it's crazy, all of these people are in their dorms, not studying, but glued to the Facebook.com. It's a problem, or something like that. It was a very good pitch. They started at K. What is your hook for your startup? If you had just a moment to kind of make me interested with some little thing, it's not about your problem or your solution, but it's something that's going to interest me. So if you want to think storytelling, start at a hook. Now, Three act structure. The Godfather. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> what is the fundamental problem that the Godfather is about? If you're going to think about your, um, you know, company as being a, a, a Hollywood script, you might want to think about the first act as being the point of the movie or the point of your startup. 
So in every Hollywood movie, we begin with a problem. Will the boy get the girl? Or will, go, will the girl get the boy? Will Joan of Arc win the war? Will the Godfather get revenge? And somewhere in there, there's an inciting moment where something happens that has actually caused some problem that has to be solved by the movie. So in your own startup experience, in your, your story, you might have had some inciting thing that caused you to be interested in your particular business. For me, for example, my startup is about movies and finding a way to actually stop the corruption in movies. So I was pitching um, you know, a really powerful film that made people laugh and cry and made someone scream out Jesus Christ all in one minute. But it was never going to get an Oscar because it was too provocative. It was about child abuse, pedophilia. Ah! <laughs> no one's ever going to vote for that in the Oscars. So I never had a chance of getting the high awards, but I really moved people. So my startup was realizing we need to find a better way for really powerful movies to get to the audiences. So my startup, imagine if I had rated people's heartbeat reaction when they watched my film. That was an inciting moment. That was like the beginning of the movie, right? So I'd like you to think about your startup as a movie. And I've never given this speech before. I've never been told this at you know, any startup advice thing. So I'm just generally putting it out there for you to think about. Because it's all about telling a story. So here is a little 101 from Hollywood. I was visiting filmmaker at the world's top film school, which was George Lucas and Spielberg paying all the money, but you know, being a woman filmmaker. But I learned, I studied. So have a look later, because I'm sure we're going to run out of time, I'd like to talk. But here you're going to have the act one, is the setup of an exciting incident, and then you have a climax and a confrontation, so you have a challenge. Well, in your startup life, I'm sure you've had some challenges that you have to get over. With my startup, the watches don't actually work rating your heartbeat if you're watching a movie at the same time. I could have cried when I learned that. But I found another way around it. So you can tell that story to the VCs and they see your tenacity and your resilience. You tell that story and then they want to invest in you, right? So you have the confrontation, you have obstacles, you have all these climaxes and you've got to talk about your team and they're like Lord of the Rings, you know, they're working with you to overcome and get this startup into life. And then at the end of your pitch, you can talk about the resolution. We have all of these challenges, but with your money, <coughs> how far we're going to go. With your money, we're going to solve all of that and we're going to launch and we're going to be bigger than Ben-Hur with less credits because it's only you and three or four people. So that's your resolution. Do you see what I'm talking about? Think about your pitch in a different way. Something exciting that they're going to remember. Uh, another way to look at it, uh, conflict, tension. Gosh, how much of that do we have? So, who are you in your startup? Someone asked me the other month, if you were a uh, Lord of the Rings, <coughs> which character would you be? And I instantly said that I'd be the Hobbit. <laughs> got hobbit feet actually, I have hair, little hair that grows in me. But actually when I started talking it through and with this advisor, I realized no, I'm Gandalf. I make magic happen. I'm powerful and I do things with technology that you know, impresses people. I'm Gandalf, not the hobbit. You have to think for yourself about who you are. And I would like to say you are the hero of your startup story. Yes? So make sure that your VCs get that side of the story. They don't just hear the Hobbit and all of the trials. They hear the magic that you make. All right? You are the protagonist in that story. So your homework, if you choose to do it or accept it, is to actually <coughs> stop reading up about pitch decks and start reading a little bit about Hollywood storytelling. Now we'll talk a bit about Silicon Valley style. Uh, who knows what that little picture is? I don't know if the cartoon represented it. It's Noah's Ark. Why did I pick that? Because all the animals have to walk in in twos. <laughs> Gosh, that drives me crazy. You don't get money unless you're married. 
You have a co-founder. I don't, I don't have a ring. I don't get along so well with people. I think most startups would end up in divorce court. But that's not the way Silicon Valley thinks about it. So sometimes we have to frame things into the Silicon Valley mold. So I have to talk to them about how I'm looking right now for a co-founder, but I'm so capable. I'm a young global leader. I can do everything twice. Twice as good as anyone else. But anyway, I'm getting to the pitch deck here that's the Silicon Valley formula. I just told you about Hollywood's formula. And yeah, the three-act structure is a formula. It gets a little bit banal. In fact, they even teach you at page 29, you have to have your twist. Otherwise, they'll look at page 29 in your script. If they don't see it there, they don't keep reading. The same with Silicon Valley. They're going to look and see your deck. So, the deck, the ace, Airbnb. Here is Airbnb pitching some time back. So I have a feeling that you guys have all read about the decks, have you? I, I see a few nods. How come the girls <coughs> are leaning in more right now? I'm seeing more girls nodding. Is it me reading that? Okay, and you're nodding. Thank you. Well, I'll go quickly then because I think you understand. The problem, Airbnb had a problem that they solved. Hotels leave you disconnected. There's no easy way to book rooms. The solution, a web platform. Do you see how they made this deck? And this is actually photos from them presenting on stage. It amazed me that there you know, wasn't a lot of color there. Perhaps that's just the picture. But they, they kept it so simple. Again, don't, keep, don't make things busy. Market validation. I think you're all nodding. That's great, because I find all of these a little bit too banal. But they're so important. I just mean, you know, for me, the storytelling is very formulaic, but so important. Market size. The product, oh, I'm going to go back, sorry. The thing that they don't have in here, though, is traction. And I think that's also a very important slide. And we're getting back to our Hollywood style, you know, telling about how much traction your startup has got is part of that. See how much progress I've made despite Gandalf nearly falling off the cliff. I survived. Then we have the executive summary, which you know about. This is part of a st startup deck, not Airbnb, but uh, you know, the, it's the one page that says everything in the one page for the, you know, the faster read. The elevator pitch, <coughs> God help us all. Yeah, you all know that one. Give us a startup pitch in just one minute. If I haven't been convinced, I'm going to keep running out of that elevator. And then we have the blurb, which is just one paragraph. And again, I've put up here an example instead from a book. The book blurb. This book was written by an author who's been there. They write from a place of bitter experience and tough research. This book is hard to read in parts due to its gritty realism, but it's a book which will stay with the reader long after the last page has been turned. Can you translate your startup story into something that's going to give that kind of emotion and interest? All right, then I wanted to end on this. You've all heard, obviously, Steve Jobs' famous quote, stay hungry, stay foolish. We often think about it in terms of the, the startup founders, and trust me, I've been hungry for, for many months now. But I would like to have you think about it in terms of your pitch. Keep the investors hungry for a little more. Keep the press hungry to ask you for more questions. Don't tell them everything, because then you're likely to bore them. Keep them curious to ask you more. So keep them hungry in what you're doing. So that's my tips on storytelling for startups. <laughs> and uh, how are we going for time? Because I'm sure um, we've run through a lot, but as I said, I've got some other um, slide decks ready for you too with some other tips if we have any more time. We do. Fantastic. Okay. Because um, I know we started late. Was it? Um, all right. Count. All right. 7.30. Oh, I've been talking for about an hour. <coughs> Gosh. You're still awake. That's okay. Did you want to ask me any questions while we just have um, flick over to my top 10 tips, or do you want to just go straight to my top 10 tips for women and men? Yes. Would you mind just while we answer a question, if they could yeah, just yeah, switch I'm over? Kidding. Perfect. Hey. Um, you, you, were, you were talking about uh, their presentation, and you thought that uh, they have no uh, traction shown uh, 
Oh, just the, that slide example that I found on the internet um, had various slide the pages, but it didn't have traction, I noticed. So I wanted to suggest that you do include that because I think it's one of the best because every startup, you've made progress. Again, it's the storytelling of how you, how you put it. And, you know, be creative with that. I mean, for example, one of the pitches I gave in Silicon Valley, I spoke about how I had actually been stopped by Belize uh, immigration. They wouldn't let me back into America because the guy was trying to bribe me. Uh, he, he, he knew I, I said I have a, you know, a startup and I'm doing things with Apple Watch. And he asked me for a watch. He said, I want one. I've got all the other Apple products. And then told him what I did. And he said, that's really cool. And I said, if you can't convince a Belizean border control agent that your startups of interest, you got nothing. But if you can, that's traction. And they really liked that. I mean, but it was true. I'd actually shown an example of someone that wasn't in venture capital world, a Belizean you know, immigration officer that had been you know, finding what I do really cool. So it was traction as far as I was concerned. I, I think it's a really great slide. I mean, that's, again, you know, every, every slide deck, you'll find a million of them online. They do often say have no more than 12 pages, and I think that's why perhaps have less. But I think traction's a really great one. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you want to just, I just uh, wasn't quite sure where the, um, yes, if you wouldn't mind just uh, to switch over to my, my have deck have there. You seen the yeah. uh, have you seen the difference between the U.S. and the European investors mm -hmm. and the uh, pitching for them? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I've mainly pitched to U.S., but a few of the young global leaders are investors that have been kind of advisors to me. And yeah, I, I do think there's a bit of a difference. I'm trying to think how I can explain it. Um, I think the American style is very, very brash and ambitious. And um, I'm speaking movies here as well. The, the European style is more understated. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, not the video. It's just I have another deck on, oh, on the. That, okay. Yeah, we, we copy them over. I think again, it's sort of like we were talking about being being a woman. You know, it doesn't look very good to brag about yourself, and you guys are, are more European than I am, so I think you would know more. But I, I suspect that the the startup pitch is perhaps not as oh, we're going to be the next unicorn. We can take over the world, right? Whereas in America, you have to totally oversell yourself. I mean. As a metaphor, I remember being in Hollywood, and actually um, a, a Hollywood agent said to me, but I can't hear you at all. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? And he said, can you speak more louder? I literally, I cannot hear you. And I, I, I didn't think I was whispering. I was just speaking in a normal tone. But in America, in California, they seem to speak so loudly. They're almost shouting at each other. He actually thought that I was hard to hear. And that, that was a very strange thing, but I just had to learn there are these different kind of attitudes and, and presentation styles, I suppose. So perhaps that might be something to think about if you go to America, try to be a little more, you know, American and speak bigger, speak louder, you know, have a lot more coffee before you pitch. <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm Australian, so we have a little bit of a you know equal mix of in terms of films as well of American and European style, and I think that works for my advantage. But it's a good question. All right, so top ten tips. Let's see. Um, I mean, some of these I might have covered a tiny bit, but all of my life I have been told you can't do that. It's just not possible. And I, I think I'm really excited to meet people like you and be a startup because the one thing that, that I love more than anything else is finding ways to do something I've been told not to. So I was actually told in Zimbabwe, you know, you can't film in this um, uh, you know, prison-like area, which was actually illegal to film even in Zimbabwe as it is. It's a regime. Uh, so the, the Zimbabwean said, you're not nearly black enough. And they were right. I mean, it was really already pretty dangerous to be filming undercover in Zimbabwe. So, well, you know, I was told you can't do that. But my lesson here is 
you know what, we got in touch with Amnesty International and they sent in some blacker people to take the photos and give them to me and we found a way to do things. So whenever someone tells you, you can't do that, that is, I think, your trigger to know there's a great opportunity there. So that's one thing that I, I my first tip. I, I was thinking just the other month before I came here, um, I'd, had a, I'd had a pretty rough time with a friend who's very pro-Trump and I'm not. And I, I, I told him off. He said that he thought that all, um, all of these uh, camps of migrants in Europe and America were, were really bad because they're not even locked up. And I was so insulted. I, I said to him, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually a migrant. And, um, and I, I lost a good friend. And I was thinking about it later, that what would my epitaph or tombstone say? I'd say, Wendy Dent, she spoke her mind. <laughs> but I brought this up as the top 10 tips for startups because that's actually what got me where I am today and what's given me a profile and an identity. So I really encourage you as individuals and as startups to speak your mind about things, about Ukraine, about technology, to go on Twitter because people will really admire you for saying things that others don't. And you know why that's important? It's leadership. And you are leaders. As entrepreneurs, you are pioneers and you are leading the future. And if you don't have an opinion and voice it, then you're never making decisions and being a leader. And I encourage VCs particularly to invest in women that speak about women in tech and speak about discrimination because they're the ones that are brave enough to. And I don't think they should be investing in anyone who's actually coping uh, under those situations but not mentioning it, right? Because it's cowardly. So that's why I'm totally out there, and I've been told, you ruffle feathers. And I'm like, I'm the resident feather ruffler. I'm doing a good job. So it's made me uh, a person of interest, a profile. I get TV interviews. I have people follow me on Twitter. I, I wrote the other day on Twitter, because I was having a bad day. I wrote, I said, you know what it's like being a woman in tech? It's like trying to walk down the, uh, walk down the street while people are trying to punch you in the face. <laughs> it was true, you know? but I had a whole lot of people like that tweet and retweet and I felt a whole lot better. But my point is it's created my identity and it's made me stronger to be Teflon, right? Like I told you, when those VCs said we want to, you know, said fuck, fuck, fuck me or leave, you know, I had to be that strong. So my tip for you is speak your mind, always. One thing I found in international relations, um, and perhaps you'll, you'd agree with me, is you know we have a lot of problems in this world, and I really encourage you to be that person, being more ambitious and picking the higher hanging fruit, because a lot of the money goes to the startups and a lot of the nonprofits that are saying all the same things that everyone's always been doing. But someday, I think if you're the one who's more ambitious, people are going to see that and they're going to respect that. And the more vocal we are, the more you, you'll be the one that's noticed. So the thing that was the turning point for me in my startup was being more ambitious. I was doing um, human rights mapping of, of data. Again, I told you that was my beginnings. And it was you know, an exciting thing to me. I was mapping movies, and then you know, Periscope came along and got the money for that first. But what did I do? I started thinking, how can I use wearable technology? This is really exciting and interesting. And I started working with neuro headsets that would read people's brains, you know? And I got really excited about that, and I was more ambitious. And I ended up showing that and demoing that. And my first pitch, I got chosen for the top tech summit in the world. I was showing on Financial Times with this neuro headset. And then I realized it was a little bit clockwork orange, you know? People don't want their minds to be read. And I pivoted into the smartwatches. But as I told you before, it's now that reading people's emotions that's actually got me to a place where I have something beyond Periscope and mapping movies. So what was I doing? I was picking higher hanging fruit, right? If you ever find you're kind of not really exciting people, you're not really getting there, think bigger, right? Enjoy the roller coaster. Isn't being a startup fun? Yeah. Gosh, gosh, it's fun. I was thinking the other day, you know, I'm crying salty tears today. It's really hard. But, you know, I put on some Dolly Parton, working nine to five, and she sings in that, pour myself a cup of ambition, and she, you know, she really, like, tells the truth about how hard it is. And I thought, who wouldn't want to be doing something like this instead of a nine to five job? 
Yeah, we have to learn to think of these as the good times and roll with the punches. And, um, and that's, that's the ride that we're on. So enjoy that roller coaster. Here's me giving advice here, saying be wary of advice. Why? Because particularly if you're a woman, they're going to tell you to do the opposite, it sometimes seems, no matter what you do, right? And often a VC or an advisor will feel really good to give you some you know, point of view. You should do that. You should do the opposite. But the lesson that I have for you is if someone's going to give you advice or be an advisor, particularly if they want equity, they need to have skin in the game. If they are not giving you money as well, if they're not investing in your startup and taking a cut, should you really take that advice? Because it's really easy. I mean, Intel actually said, you know, sorry, not Intel, I forgot to say names. Ooh, this will be recorded. Someone in the Bay Area once said, I think there's a lot of movement in the market right now and in that particular industry. So, you know, it's best to sort of sit it out a little bit and then move in later. And I said, no, I think that time of disruption is an opportunity. But you know what? If they'd actually had their money in my startup, and I said, if you'd actually invested a million dollars, would you be telling me that? Right? It's so, it's so easy to give advice. Advice is cheap. But once they've got the position, they're really going to think differently about what advice they give you, you know? So that's why I say be wary of advisors. You can always find new friends. You know, being a startup, I've lost a lot of friends. They, they get a little bit bored of how hard it is and that you're never around. My family think I'm crazy doing what I'm doing. You know, you can always find new friends. And if you speak your mind, like I said before, not everyone's going to agree with you. My friend who thinks that migrants should all be locked up probably doesn't like me much anymore. And I felt bad about that. But someone once said to me, that's OK. You can always get new friends. Right? And maybe you need new friends if they're the kind of friends you have. So on that line too, there's a great quote here. This is Cindy Gallup. And if you haven't followed Cindy Gallup, I really recommend it, particularly the women in the room. She's one of the leaders in the advertising industry. And she's one of the strongest voices about uh, women in technology. And she said, you'll never own the future if you're concerned about what people think of you. And again, I think if you're going to be a leader, you're going to be disruptive. You're going to be challenging people. And they're not going to agree with you. They're not going to like it. But so what, huh? Don't be afraid to disappoint people. Don't be beholden to extortion. When I was in the Bay Area, I was trying to get developers to work on my startup. And I had a, a, a very you know, promising young chief technology officer. He wanted to have equity in my startup. But he was only going to do about two hours work to do a plug-in. I couldn't get people to work without wanting to take extravagant amounts of money and I knew that they weren't actually deserving it. So you know what? I learned to code. I did. I did it myself. I went online and got free courses. And now, you know, this, this startup that I have, I did the whole thing. I did it all. And actually, I look back and I realized one or two years I'd spent pitching trying to get investment. In that time, I could have learned to be a full stack developer. I would have spent less and spent less time. Don't be beholden to extortion. The same with VCs. If you can do your startup without needing a cent of their money, please do it, right? It's not only about keeping the equity, it's about keeping your vision. I hope you'll find VCs and investors that are a great match for you. But don't ever be needing them that badly that you're going to accept what's not good enough, particularly if you're a woman thinking about it the other day. You need to be in a position where you can say, yes, I'm willing to accept equal pay. <laughs> Not I'm willing to accept uh, less than equal pay because I really need that investment right now. Okay, so please find a way to do it without them and do it yourself or find the people that will help you. Cut out the conferences. She says, speaking next week at the conference Black Sea Summit, I'm sure it'll be excellent. I highly recommend it. But really, I wasted a lot of time going to a lot of conferences where I had like startups say to me that you know that I'd made their heartbeat rise and they weren't going to give me any money. You know, sometimes you're better off spending that time learning to code, working in your startup rather than getting distracted. You know, going to all of these events and meetings and cocktail parties. Top 10 tip, don't give up like the Hobbit. Sometimes you don't give up, you just need to rest. 
you can feel like it's all too much and I'm never going to get there. And, you know, if you wear yourself out and burn out, you won't. But you might need to take a weekend off. I know I do, you know. So, you know, when you feel that low, just try to remember, I don't have to stop. I just need to take a break and have fresher thinking. And because you're all very special, I brought in an 11th one. You be you, because everyone else might be doing other similar things, but you have the particular DNA for your startup that no one else can do. So, you know, we need you, and you need to not try to be someone else, or be Zuckerberg, or be some other data initiative, but find what is your particular story. Like, you're the hobbit, what's your journey? What are you going to contribute to this world that no one else can? All righty. Now, I had um, just a few as well with um, the women in tech, if you like, we could go through pretty quickly, and then I'm sure um, you've all got wonderful, exciting things to do and people to meet, or startups to create. We'll go through some, I like talking about women in tech, as you can tell. But I think it's good for you guys to hear too, you know? And also, you're going to relate to it, because if you go to the Bay Area, you're still going to be seen as not a white American from MIT, or maybe you are, so, you know, we should all rally for diversity. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Top 10 tips for women in tech and for men if you like. This is what I've learned to say, particularly to developers that I'm outsourcing. You can call me sir. And you know what? One of them responded, yes sir. And that made me feel really good. <laughs> I highly recommend it. When I'm, uh, you know, at cocktail parties and events, as a woman, it, as I said, you can, you know, get people react a little bit strangely if they see you as too bossy or they see you. So I've learned before any of those moments, I say, I'm going to lean in here. So when there's a group of four men or even, you know, three or two, I, I shuffle over and I say, excuse me, I'm going to lean in here. And literally I lean in. But they get the, 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 the analogy and they go, oh, sure, sure. Whereas otherwise, if you're like, oh, who's she? She's a bit... She's a bit forward, isn't, she, isn't it? If you're going to argue about a point and a meaning, it's still hard as a girl to kind of put your hand up and say, well, no. Hang on, did she just say no? <laughs> but you can say, I'm going to lean in here and say, no, I disagree on that. And it somehow kind of is like a disclaimer that makes it all OK. Shouldn't have to be this way, but it uh, does actually help. So this, again, no one's given me this advice. It's just what I've learned. This is so important. I'm not, I'm not meaning about the food, eat lunch, it is really important. But why I wrote this gets back to my earlier points. In Hollywood, remember I was telling you about someone saying to me, fuck me or leave. We never spoke about that, about women's rights and things. It's now become a thing, amazingly. Uh, because there was an expression that if you speak about what's wrong or speak about that, you'll never eat lunch in this town again. And you know what? I realized I wasn't eating lunch anyway. And who'd want to eat lunch anyway if that's the kind of town it is, if that's the way things roll? So I started speaking up about it. And I was one of the first. I, I'm amazed to say it, but I was one of the first to be speaking about the sexual harassment. And you know what? I get more meetings. So my, my point here is a metaphor. Eat lunch. Speak about it. I've had the press even hit on me. I've had journalists that have offered to do write-ups about my startup, and then, you know, they want more than that. And I thought, but I can't say anything because I'm never going to get a write-up by that reviewer or that paper. You know what? I wasn't going to get a write-up anyway. They only wanted to sleep with me. I, I called them out on it. People heard about me and my startup because I was writing about that. So that's my point there. Speak up. Don't buy shoes, buy real estate. <laughs> I'm meaning internet real estate. You know, I don't have a house. I don't even have a rental. I live like a, I don't want to say gypsy, a global citizen. But I own 52 domains, and I'm using them. So when I first was in Silicon Valley, I, um, I registered one of my websites, humanrightsonfilm.com, and my, my then boyfriend said, you know, what did you do wasting like $30 on that, you know? And I said to him, I could have bought a pair of shoes. Instead, I bought a website, you know? And even that, he could buy shoes for $30. He was in tech. That made him think. <laughs> but you know, since then, I've now got my own startup. I'm speaking in the Ukraine. He's in the Bay Area. He can barely get a speaking engagement in the town hall there. 
So, buy real estate. Sometimes as a woman, you go to a meeting and you have a feeling that no matter what you comes out of your mouth, they're about to say but. It's true, and there are people that are going to be saying but no matter what you say. My advice is move on and speak to the other guy that was listening to you while the other guy was arguing with you. There are going to be people that just have that subliminal, subconscious bias. And I'm not just talking about women, I'm talking about anyone who's different. So you just have to kind of learn to navigate that and don't try to change everyone, but find the person that is interested. Uh, I gave you my point about advisors before. Avoid flirts. Well, I told you my stories about you know, sexual harassment, but actually I'm meaning this again metaphorically. There's um, you know, an increasing movement to actually have women you know, have startup funding uh, to you know, be coders, but I have the feeling, to be honest, that a lot, a lot of it is flirting with giving women opportunities. I get meetings, but I never get a check. They never follow up. It's like I'm a curiosity. So I actually tweeted the other day, you know, women, we're not here pitching for your entertainment. Don't give compliments, give checks. And that was a point that, you know, avoid the flirts of people that are just window shopping and they want to hear your idea and they'll listen. The Silicon Valley companies will ve very openly listen, but they won't necessarily follow up. So you have to kind of be aware of that and I have to say uh, a little bit of a term that, you know, a few of us are starting to spread around is be wary of brain rape. <laughs> You know, there's people that are going to want to take your ideas and they don't even think that it's, it's taking them. So that, you have to say to them, you know, I'm pitching here, would you like to follow up? If people don't have follow up, I say, I have a business to run, could you get back to me? And especially if people are going to hit on you, you say, I'm sorry, I'm here at a networking event for my business, I have a business to run. This isn't Tinder, right? <laughs> Never accept no. Because sometimes, the more you go forward in your startup, like I said, you get to a point where they can't ignore you anymore. You get bigger, you get stronger. Don't accept no, keep going. And the advice from the White House summit that I went to even, was women, you need to add a zero. And then they might take notice. You walk in asking for $10, of course they would be interested. You ask for 1000 10000 a 100000 Maybe they go, well, that's cute. You walk in and say, like a million bucks. I think they're going to listen to you more, right? And you better be worth it. But what I mean is, add a zero, be important, be worth it. For women, don't give up your day job. Well, you know, you might want to, but just know first the statistics. I thought that I was going to be profitable about a year ago. I'm still trying to get the funding, but I've learned the statistics. Women start out their ventures with six times less capital than men. I think it takes us six times longer. Six months ago, I wrote to Google with the question about uh, startup you know, accounts, and I still haven't heard back. I think there is statistics that prove it is harder. So I think we just have to be a little bit more real and men too about the, the statistics. And personally, if I was right now able to have a side job, I would be you know, able to bootstrap a little bit longer. So you know, that's just a personal suggestion, but think carefully about that. Think about marriage. Well, I'm meaning as a startup, of course. Think about getting married, the co-founder thing. I, I put this in because one thing I've learned in the Bay Area is that they do not want to invest in single people. They don't call it single, but they don't want to invest in someone that doesn't have a co-founder. But I do think you need to think very carefully about that because a lot of co-founders end up in divorce courts. So my personal thing is I now say to VCs, okay, why don't you want to have a sole, sole founder? And they say, well, because, you know, what happens if that person dies? And I have to point out, what are the statistical amounts of co-founders ending up in divorce courts compared to your entrepreneurs dying? <laughs> I think the statistics are like this many, this is the chances of me dying compared to this is the chances of me ending up, you know, having a, having a problem with my co-founder is not getting there, whereas I can outsource and I can hire people. I can totally do a good job directing. So I, I just think something to think about. Again, I don't want to be giving you black and white opinions. 
And final tip for women, no, it's not just you. It took me a long time to realize this, and Cindy Gallup, as I told you, you should check it out. Check out what she writes about. Follow you know, the, the movement, the increasing amount of people writing about it, because it's going to help you get through those hard times. And just last week, for example, I remember I wrote, actually, I feel really dizzy today, and I wrote, gosh, that moment when you're feeling dizzy, I must have hit my head on that glass ceiling again. But that's okay, because I know it's not just me, and that means I could go get through the day, the week, the year, and keep going. So, I hope that has been of help. I'm so thrilled to meet you all and, and hear your thoughts now as well and any questions you have. And thank you so much for, for listening to me. to give away all the details because I don't want someone copying and launching it before I've been able to launch. But it's been enough that um, people, VCs say, this is interesting, what are you doing? And I can say, well, if you're interested in investing, I can tell you, you know, and then they, they get it and I, and I give the details. So, uh, the question was, uh, do, you think, do you think that it is important for a project to have this social media activity, mm -hmm. uh, like Facebook or LinkedIn or LinkedIn? I don't think it is, because I don't think the VCs are, are really caring whether you're tweeting or not. I mean, unless you've already launched and, you know, if you have a presence with customers and clearly, you know, they're expecting an operative business that, you know, has a presence on Twitter. But if, if you're in veto, no. I mean, they know that you're under-resourced. They know people are stretched. I don't think, I don't think social media is an issue at all. So, you know, I, I barely tweet there much, but you know, sometimes I've had, um, I've had the odd filmmakers say, oh well, you know, you're not even on Twitter, and I go, well, fine, <laughs> I don't want a difficult customer, I don't want you in my beta, because you're going to be a diva, and I have another person here who's so keen to have their film on, and isn't going to, you know, belittle me and judge me, so it was one, of, I've got so many tips here, but one that I didn't have time for is, you know, don't, don't waste your time with toxic users and customers, you're already overstretched, um, so no, I don't think that Twitter is important, but if you did want to have a look, I'm very active on Twitter as, a, as an individual, as Wendy Dent, because that's where I do have a voice, and um, I'm probably tweeting far too much, <laughs> but you know, I like to vent. <laughs> Yeah. I, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you were talking a bit about neuroscience and reading the emotions. Uh, could you say is that uh, some kind of global trend in the world? <gasps> are there many like startups in mm. Silicon Valley which are like using these techniques? Um, I think it's growing. Yes. Th there's not a lot of startups. There's there's a few, but I do think that it's actually a, a future. I think that with AI, for example, you're you're seeing a movement more into uh, people being able to read our responses. Like you know, when you're going to communicate with a robot, they're kind of you know reading a, a human's um, you know voice, their emotions, and I I think that. We're not yet there, but we're going to be at a point where you're actually communicating with your computer without a mouse. That, you know, right now we have to do that to go enter. There's actually an ad in the US for a phone uh, uh, where it's Christopher Walker, Walker <coughs> one of those stars. Uh, it shows uh, his phone and he's saying, you know, these days we, we, we are on our phones so much of multitasking. It's not even multitasking, it's regular tasking. And at the end he says, look, I can even control my phone with a wink. And it's a, it was interesting. I thought, can you really with the phone? Um, I don't think you can. I think it was a, a witty script, script line, but I think you will be able to. And I think it's going to be neuroscience that is controlling that. And 
and I mean, I started pitching this in Silicon Valley, but the, the point I was making to them is, you know, you have all these VR sets that are literally on your head and, you know, you're wearing this. They actually have, you know, bracelets <coughs> that, that can sit on your head, and I do think they're actually taking, you know, sweat glands, they're able to see where your eyes are looking. Um, my startup is using the watches as first beginning, but I think there's going to be increasing sophistication in the reading of analytics and the data that's going to then be, be taking all of that information in. So, yeah, it will be you know, neuroscience leading a lot more. And they, they do have, for example, now, and this is even my colleagues are doing this, they have people walking because the neuro headsets are reading their brain. So in the past, someone was, you know, had to control the wheelchair with their remote, and now uh, then they're able to control, you know, robotic legs with the remote. And now the neuro headset will mean that they think I need to walk and then the robotic legs. So you want to have people that were paralyzed being able to walk. And one of these is Mark Pollock. You can have a look. He's an Irish um, young global leader who's actually a blind person who then fell through a window and broke his back. And he was determined to not accept the doctor saying he will never walk again. And he's now, with the help of the neuro headsets, one of the people taking part in this, um, to be able to walk. So that's pretty powerful. People said, you know, you can't take readings for film from all of these headsets because, you know, there's not really any valuable data yet. And I said, well, if they can make someone walk, I think we can use a little bit of information for them. Yeah. So I, I hope that answered you. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, what kind of documents do you send uh, to invest uh, investors before uh, the meeting? Mm -hmm. um, a general description of the project budget or your right. presentation as well. Yes, right. Don't well, you think again, that, uh, in fact, uh, they mm -hmm. um, uh, have uh, uh, received the first impression about your project before and uh, perhaps even have made a uh, decision at Yeah. What do, what do you think? Well, that's why, as I said, I try to give them less. Because for me, I really want to have the face-to-face -face meeting. And when they meet with me, they tend to listen more and see me as a, as a leader that has the business now. So whereas if they read a deck, they're more likely to kind of you know, put it to the side. So I try to give less and have them curious to meet with me and then answer more questions or be able to go deeper. So again, like I said, trying to you know, be a bit of a tease, really. Try to keep some mystery. Um, but, you know, it, it is a hard competitive environment. Of course, not everyone's able to get that meeting. You've got to give them enough to get them interested. And some will just say, no, I need a deck or I'm not able to, you know, consider this. So you might have to send them a deck. Um, but it, it, it really does depend, I think, on the situation and what you're wanting to get out of that connection. I'm not quite sure about uh, about Europe as well, but from from the states, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to to meet people at events, and then you give them the you know the one power your elevator speech, then they're interested. You can give them a bit more. I tend to give them my video because I think that presents better uh, than my pitch deck does. And I say, you know, I'm a filmmaker. I this is this is my storytelling, and it's different. Um, and this is a nice snazzy nice video. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't feel good about giving decks, as I said. I think people tend to just skim read them. They might be on the phone to their partner while they're doing that and they're having lunch. You don't know that you've got their attention fully to read it. Whereas when they're with me in person or they're at a shark tank, I think you've got their attention a bit more. Yeah. Come on, guys, lean in. <laughs> question uh, is regarding your uh, presentation point uh, to tech or not to tech. Oh, uh, to tech yep. or not to tech, yes. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, uh, you suggest not to show video uh, while you lost an event or so on. Uh, can you please underline it mm, slightly deeply? Why should not? Oh, I meant don't do a live thing with your tech. So, for example, um, you know, my startup, I would be quite happy to show, you know, the screen record of, of my, 
my app working. I have a simulator, for example. But I mean, right now, even later with you guys, I could show you if I have the web connection, you know, my simulator, I can show you on the watch. But the chances of something going wrong, um, like for example, just last week, I was in San Diego showing a friend and I moved the folder uh, of my project and I hadn't realized that one of the files of my app was actually a, like a, a bookmark to another file, it was shortcut. And so when I'd moved the folder, it hadn't moved the file and so the whole thing broke. And it wasn't representative of my startup, but it would have totally given the wrong impression. Um, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one like that, I could say, hang on, let me, oh, I've got to move that file, restart. But if you're in the middle of a presentation like this, it's about the worst thing that can happen. <laughs> so it's better to, you know, give a, give, a, give a little video of a screen record of the whole thing running, right? And, and then you can show them again later. But just be wary of it is the point. And as I said, I mean, look, my friend... Um, is a young global leader who's you know one of the the top people of Mozilla, Mozilla Firefox. He he made Apache. He's the one that told me uh, for my pitching. He said don't don't do demos. And he said you know we don't do demos. It wasn't just meaning Wendy. You know you're new. <laughs> I don't advise it. It was that they don't demo live tech. So it's it's actually not something to be embarrassed about to say you know I'm just going to show you how it works and and not have that risk, right? right. Like what if your battery fails right then and there and you know, tech tech burns out, you know, batteries don't live forever. My iPhone the other week just died from some, you know, ping. I don't know what happened. Apple don't, doesn't know what happened. But if that had happened to me in the middle of my, you know, meeting to the Silicon Valley startup, it would be hard to recover from that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Did that clarify a little? Uh, I wasn't yes, meaning not yes, show it. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I slightly missed the point during the presentation that we told about live demos, but not, uh, not about the videos. Right, yes. I was just meaning like find, um, you know, like you can do on your, I can show you later how to a screen record yeah. where you'd be walking through and it's literally yeah, going to sure. record it and they'll get the idea and they know you're not, you know, doing CGI Hollywood trying to put that together. <laughs> Maybe. What is the best? Uh, what are the best places for pitching, and how you engage investor uh, to uh, to have a personal meetings? Because uh, all of them are really busy, and they yes. don't want to waste time for uh, lots of uh, presentation. Yeah, they tend to do the you know the shark tanks for that reason because there's a kind of vetting, a gatekeeping process. They know that there's other people you know nominating and so forth. Well, you know, in the Bay Area, and that's where I've spent most of my time, so I'm sorry I don't really know the European circuit so well, but there are, there are the kind of um, incubators, and they are good places to go, even if you're not at the incubator yourself, because, the, you know, the sharks are going there in a sense. You can actually have a chance to meet people. So I went to one, um, you know, that was a whole lot of other startups pitching, and I have to say, I, I think I'm too nice, I'm too good. I didn't feel like it was right for me to be pitching all these startups instead of, you know, like the data incubator. I, I feel wrong to come to your event and kind of hijack it by trying to, you know, pitch mine. But people do that. I mean, they do that. It's a good way to meet them. I mean, that's why people go to the, the conferences, like the web, web summits of the world. Um, but you're also amassing more competition, you know. Um, one thing that could be good is to contact investors before an event is coming up, not too soon before when they're busy, you know, going to flights and not in the middle of it because they're drowning in pitches, but, you know, a, two or three weeks before and say, I read that you're going to this or that conference to speak. This is what I'm doing. So you've got a connection to speak to them about. Yeah. Um, it, it, is, it is hard to get their attention, but again, it's personal style. I personally find, you know, people like me when they meet me, whereas I, you know, if I'm just another person trying to knock on their door, but then other people are good at writing those killer emails and if you, if you find a way to give them a reason to connect, like I, I, I noticed that you know you're interested in data on this field, that helps. You have to find a relationship that means something to them, so they know you're not just cold calling. Yeah. How, you, uh, how do you use uh, personal information about this person, uh, investor, for example? So uh, you know uh, they 
hear all this and you still yeah. say, how do you like this, uh, for example, sport or traveling? So it's uh, very obvious and... Uh, yeah, they, I mean, they get used to people kind of finding out. I mean, a lot of people connect with them on social media and they, I mean, I know Mike Butcher, for example, um, you know, gets pitched a lot and they, uh, but I, I've come, sorry, he's the you know, editor of TechCrunch, he's now a sir, just got knighted, but I, I'm you know, a Facebook friend with him, as he has a lot, and I, you know, I don't pitch him about one thing before an event, but I, you know, I follow what he writes about, and when he talks about you know, refugees in, in, in Syria, I, you know, if I have something valuable to add, I, I make a comment, and so he's come to know who I am, and it doesn't feel like I'm you know, targeting him and using him. Right, so I think you have to build relationships, and if you follow various journalists, you will get to know what they're interested in, and you can say, "Hey, I, I've noticed that you know you're particularly interested in AI, and you know this is something that is of interest to me." Or, you know, I mean, your particular example. Yeah, but also I have to say there are a few press journalists, and Mike Butch is one of them, that have their very specific rules about how they want to be pitched. And Mike, for example, says, "I want." You know, one sentence of this, then I want two sentences of the, and they almost have their, he has his own kind of deck that he expects. And I personally think it's a bit unfair. I mean, you know, startups, we don't have the time to be personalizing our pitch deck for everyone. But you, you, you could also research a little for the most important people so you know not to offend, <laughs> offend them and annoy them. Because you don't, you don't want to do that. And some of them are a lot more fussy than others. Yeah. You recommended not to pitch if you don't ready to take money right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. But uh, negotiations might take uh, a lot of time. If you wait until you need it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, some time. that's true. Well, yeah, you have to kind of um, plan in advance for that and, and know. So, yeah, if you're about to be running out of money and that's your last stop, then maybe that is the time you have to pitch and, and get ready. Uh, but I think. I mean, I, I think, to be honest, you, you have to push negotiations. You know, you have to look. The, the friend of mine, the fellow young Mozilla, said to me this. You know, if you really, at the last the last hundred, you know, dollars or thousand dollars, and you have an investor interested, he said, you, you should tell them and say, I do need an answer quickly. And okay, you're going to be running a risk that they, they can't move that fast. But a lot of them do understand. Bootstrapping only goes so far. I have come now to say to people, you know, I need to pull up now so I can keep the lights on. And they, they don't mind you being honest about it. So I think that you should say, you know, I can't stretch this out. Because, okay, very important tip then, before the gentleman leaves, last tip that I have to say. There's an expression, Hollywood is the only place in the world where you can die of encouragement. That's wrong. There's also Silicon Valley. Probably every startup circuit. You can die of waiting and encouragement saying, that's great, we'll get back to you. And they just don't want to say no. Like the reason in Hollywood they don't say no is because they don't want to be the person that turned down the, the next Spielberg. Right? Silicon Valley, they're a little bit more honest and say, look, you know, we don't have that in our you know, quota right now. We don't have funds or the next round. But a lot of them will just not say no because they're busy and they don't want to hurt your feelings. But they're really giving you a no. So you have to think, OK, I have one week to get an answer. Or write to people say, you know, I've tried to get in touch, but I haven't yet heard from you. So could you let me know now? Otherwise, I'll consider um, you know, other options and move on from here. So you're telling them, you know, I can't wait anymore. But yeah, I think a lot of people, and I'm telling you from experience, have just been left hanging. And if, if it's not a yes, it is a no, right? You know that, yeah? If there's no money, then it's a no. Yeah. Well, maybe it's the last question. Sure. Uh, really inspiring presentation, so I have many questions here. So I hope it will be the last question. Oh, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I try to be honest, guys. Could, yeah, could you say at least five uh, tips uh, mm -hmm. uh, tips how to make uh, investor hungry to ask uh, questions. Ask the next question. Hmm. Five tips how. You mentioned the presentation. <laughs> for the next presentation. Sorry. For the for next for the next presentation. For the next presentation. <laughs> well, I would I would it always the tell them. Okay. Well, uh, you know, coming up with five on the spot. Let's see. I can at least give you one. 
One thing I always do is say, I'm working on more and going further with this. So for example, one thing I do is, um, if I have to tell them my secret source, so to speak, like I said, I don't, semi still. Just say I have to say, I'm using the smartwatch. I'm using the Apple Watch right now. And I'm worried that they might go, great, I'll do the Apple Watch. The way I keep them interested, or if they're an investor, want them to come back, is I say, and I have more in development. I'm exploring some further, you know, technological, <coughs> you know, possibilities here. I'm experimenting with more. I'm pioneering further. And that's actually true. And, you know, people think I'm crazy if I tell them the whole story of what I'm aiming for. But it's not just this. It's That's MVP. So that's the thing. You're saying, this is my MVP, but my big vision goes beyond that. So then they're not going to want to, you know, write you off. And they're going to be intrigued. Right? That's one thing. And you can let them know, you know, I have... I have other parties interested in what I'm doing, you know. And I mean, right now I have I have some very serious companies, you know, that are said they're they keen to collaborate. I mean, that keeps big tech companies interested to know. Hang on, what's my competition doing? I don't have to tell them what, but that will keep them wanting to know more. Yeah. So that's a few. <laughs> I'm sure that I had a few others in the in the slide deck. Yes. Um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much. You're all very inspiring to you, you know. You keep me going, so thanks. All right, let's have a party. <laughs>